Hello, everyone. A small plug in before we start the discussion. The registration for Advanced Skill Actuarial Internship Program is already open. It's a hybrid program with real job experience. Modern approach to internship it covers everything that you require to kickstart your actuarial career ahead of your peers. Program starts on 7th of August 2021. And if you have not explored our website yet, please visit www.advancedskill.com or email us at info at advancedskill.com. Thank you. I would like to uh, invite Ian Allen now uh, to take on the stage. Uh, welcome, Alan. Uh, Thanks very much. It's great to meet you all. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today. I've, as you will gather in a minute, I've really enjoyed my 30 years or more in banking and want to share that with you. So in the next slide, I want to start by talking about my experience in banking, not intended to talk about me, it's intended to show the huge variety of roles that actuaries could do in banking. You might think of actually in a very narrow domain. There's tons of things you can do in banking. So I happened to do fund management while training as an actuary. And I then went to work for a stockbroker called Phillips and Drew. You would never heard of this matter. They were bought by UBS. So the Swiss Bank UBS. So in the period I worked in investment banking for UBS, I spent two years in Tokyo getting a securities branch license, negotiating with the Minister of Finance. And then when I came back to London, I was responsible for the integration of the UBS and Phillips and Drew bonds and derivative people. So quite different, but really interesting tasks. And in this period, particularly in Tokyo, I met UBS people in investment banking, corporate banking, private banking, different areas, and saw how many opportunities there were for our actual skills in banking. So in the next slide, when I came back to the UK, I moved to the Scottish bank RBS and for 15 years was head of strategy. Now, strategy may not seem an obvious area to you, but it is a very sensible area because if you're an actuary, you understand the risks and are cautious about the risks and you can determine a prudent strategy for the bank. So in those 15 years, I was involved on day to day in all the problems and opportunities that arose in all the different areas of the business, could be credit cards in the morning, corporate banking in the afternoon. And then I was involved in these more glamorous things, which I remember. Three particular things, which as head of strategy, I led, the board had to decide, many people involved, but a leading role. We established a supermarket joint venture with Tesco. That would be a story in itself. It's a very interesting thing to do. Now, it existed in America, but we did it in a joint venture rather than a supply relationship. The acquisition of NatWest, a bank more than twice our size. And then after that, the development of a strategic partnership with Bank of China, when the Chinese banks were floating part of their shares and looking for Western bank partners. So business as usual and lots of different things. I left RBS in 2008, and the next slide, I moved to a different role to be an independent consultant in banking. I'd enjoyed banking so much, I said I didn't want to retire. In the UK, the government has really encouraged fintech and new banks to come into the market. And it's been very pleasant working with them on application for banking licenses. I know you've got very similar skills in Bangalore and Mumbai. These are very good people to work with, very technically skilled, they're not actuaries, but very bright people of less knowledge of banking and banking regulation, but very good to work with. And the role in working with them was in their banking license application and in the 
business plan and capital adequacy assessment, all these things where I really enjoy it because you've got to know the whole business, all the risks, see the big picture, do stress testing, look at different scenarios and check that the capital forecasts are adequate. So I, I think doing the capital adequacy is a very good way to get an overview of a bank. And of course, if you're doing it as a consultant rather than employee, every bank is different. You get better at it by doing one, two, three, four, five banks. But because they're different, you learn more. So I really enjoyed this and expect to carry on doing it. I've also less glamorously done for clients responses to regular consultations on capital liquidity on other matters. It doesn't sound very glamorous, but it's a very good way of keeping up to date. I think for actuaries, we don't want to get things secondhand. It's important to see the consultation and know what's coming next. Now many countries are doing consultations on climate change stress testing, which you pay attention to them. So that was my experience. Now in the next slide, the question is, what did I learn from that? What are the required qualities? If any, if you want to go into banking, what do you need? The first thing is a total change of mindset. That if you're going to work for an insurance company, other actuaries may meet you and say what exams you pass and how good that is. In my 30 years in banking, they don't really care. They have a general positive view of an actuary as competent and reliable, but are not interested in the detail. The question is much more about what can you do for us, like stress testing, rather than what exams have you passed. So if you go for a job in a bank, you have to learn, as I mentioned, banks are now looking at climate change stress testing. If you'd read the regular consultation, you can explain how you could contribute, working with others on this important task. But in going for a job into your bank, you've got to turn it around to what does a bank need to do? How can I help them rather than how clever I might think I am as an actuary? And then if you do get started working in a bank, you're not going to be working with other actuaries. You're working with accountants, people with different graduate degrees or professional qualifications. And for some actuaries that may not be so comfortable for, for me, looking back, one of the rewardings in banking was working with people who brought different skills and ideas. In the financial modeling, in these second and third points, there's a lot of focus on getting a rough answer quickly, and then if the thing seems worthwhile, doing it properly. So my impression would be comparing insurance and banking speed versus accuracy, get a rough idea, get board approval in principle, then go and do it properly and come back later. So it depends on our personalities. I find it very stimulating to be asked, what do you think the answer will be, rather than have you worked all the sums? And then to come back later, saying it is roughly what I thought, or it's different, no loss of face, to explain why it is different. We're moving on to the next slide, still on the same theme. If you're going into a bank, I, I would encourage you not to think of a particular role like head of credit risk or head of risk. I had a role called head of strategy, but I was just Ian. I knew lots of people and worked with them. I think it's more important to recognize the skills and personalities of actuaries and where we're likely to be both happy and successful. So in banking, I found problem solving really good. And in banks, there are endless problems to solve. Banks go through economic cycles and there are new challenges. Not so long ago with the banking crisis, with the subprime securities. Now we've got to work through COVID-19 and its effect in economies. And then immediately we've got to focus on climate change and its impact. So when I say problems, it doesn't mean that banks are problematic. It means it's a evolution and changing world. 
and there are always new things. And I really enjoyed in my role at RBS of we've got a problem. Can you help us to fix it and work with other people and get it sorted out? And I never found in 15 years any lack of technical skills. The issue was understanding the particular business and working with the people. I would also encourage you in banking to recognize there is a lot of criticism of banks for tick spots and plans and regulations. That's much easier and more comfortable to read the regulations and do what they say. But for actuaries, the expectation is different. For actuaries, the expectation, which I've found both as an employee, as a consultant, is that we will really understand the thing properly and be able to express judgments. We're expressing judgments of the management team or the board. It's their decision. It's not our decision normally, but they like to have a view clearly expressed to them. So I find tick box compliance bureaucracy quite nauseating. I really enjoyed in banking being at a level above that in the roles that actually should be of looking at the problem, coming up with a solution, and presenting that to the management, whoever is appropriate. But along with that goes an ability to meet challenge. In any large companies, there is a pattern of, it's better to shut up and just do what you're told. But obviously as actuaries, we are concerned about prudent re prudential risk management. And we are concerned if there are risks that don't seem to have been identified or understood. So in terms of our skills as an actuary, I found that an important thing was to raise concerns. And that requires diplomacy. I, I think it requires not being political, but political awareness to know how and when and to whom to raise concerns. If you raise them in an open meeting, people may get upset. If you raise them privately and show positive concern rather than just being critical, of course, it was done much better. And I found as an actuary, I was expected to do these things. I was expected to express judgments and be quite outspoken and expected to raise concerns. I remember once my boss saying he was surprised I hadn't raised a concern about something after the event. So I think as actuaries, this expectation of competence and integrity often defines the kind of roles that we are successful in. Finally, it may not be comfortable for all actuaries, but I think in banking, clear and concise communication is very important. Our colleagues are principally not actuaries. They don't speak the same technical language that we do. They expect us to explain the issues in words they can understand. And frankly, they don't have a lot of time to spare. So if it's a note to your boss or the chief executive, it's better to be a page and a half with an appendix than a big ramble. It's better to start with the answer and then justify it rather than have a long mystery story. And in meetings, similarly, it's better to express the view clearly and briefly and then to answer questions and say more. So that style may be different from the world of actuaries who have a common understanding and often like to go into details and technical matters. But these are, looking back at my 30 years in banking, the issues that made for success in the job. And I do think they define the sorts of jobs that we would like to do. So moving on a bit now to what banking is all about. There is a slide with assets and liabilities and so on. So looking at a bank's balance sheet, to remind you very different from insurance, perhaps the other way around, in banking, our assets are the loans that we made to individuals and companies. Other assets would include bonds and securities, and we hold liquid assets, as it says at the bottom for liquidity, Deposits may be withdrawn and you cannot ask for the loans to be repaid. So you have to maintain enough li liquid assets 
to cover any liquidity stresses. Remember here, a key nature of banking is the phrase borrow short and lend long. Deposits may go, you have to have liquidity to cover them. So the management of liquidity is a very important aspect of banking that may not be quite the same in insurance where there is a lot of matching of assets and liabilities. Banks don't tend to match in the same way. They manage liquidity risk. Then in a liabilities, the deposits from individual companies, other liabilities, it could be debt capital, and then importantly, the equity capital. We need to have capital to cover any losses. And under the rules for banking, you can only write off losses against equity capital. So when you look at the Basel regulations for banks, the focus is on equity capital because you need that for the losses that may occur. Where might the losses occur? The main risks are credit risk on the loans, market risk on the securities, and operational risk in activities. There are many other risks, like conduct risk, but these are the three main risks. If you're going for a job, a job interview in a bank, I think you'd be expected to know this slide inside out, to really understand what assets and liabilities are, not very difficult, and to have an idea about these three main risks. I think it would not be reasonable to expect you to know about the many other risks if you were a young person as an actually going for a job in a bank. But I think this slide encapsulates what I, if I were back to age 20 and going for a job interview, I would take this to look at in the bus going to the meeting just to make sure I didn't get caught out on the basics of banking. So moving on to the next slide as to whether banking is really all that different. There's a mindset that banking is a foreign country and totally different. The style and culture are a bit different, but lots of things are very similar. In insurance, where I started, although in fund management, you underwrite mortality risk, such a key issue. In banking, underwriting credit risk is, in a way, the key issue. You have investment banks are different, but for regular banks, loans and credit risk are the main job. Pricing for risk. When I worked at RBS for product pricing, I recruited actuaries. They were successful, they were well received, they were very good at the job. We understand how to do this job. Other people do as well, you work with other people, but actuaries are well suited to pricing for risks. Then reserves for claims. In banking, banks have to make provisions for credit losses the accounting standard is called IRS 9, it's quite difficult. So if I'm running a bank, I'd be very happy to have in that team at least one actuary with experience of reserves for claims. They are not the same, but they are very similar. And if you can do one, you can do the other. In asset liability management, they said the banks have to manage this liquidity risk the actuaries have credibility from insurance in asset liability management. And therefore, working for a bank in that area is entirely sensible that an actuary would make a contribution. On the capital adequacy that I spent a lot of time specializing in myself, I found as an actuary, nobody bothered whether I'd done the insurance exams or banking exams, they believed that I would have the skills to do that job, and I believe we do have the skills. There's a language conversion when you move from insurance to banking, the terminology of banking being insurance, but the task is very similar. And in model validation, there is effectively harmonization. It is a process, a governance process, and we live under a code and are very mindful of the obligations of the code and standards and so on. So I wouldn't say it would be rude to say that actuaries are better than bankers at this. I'd repeat the phrase that if I were managing a bank, 
I'd be very happy to have at least one actuary in the model validation team, bring that strong sense of following the code and being very careful. And moving on to possible routes into banking, having explained that it's not frankly that different from insurance, the logic follows that for people with some experience in banking, a lateral transfer is the most obvious thing. When I went to RBS to be head of strategy, I could point to my career as having been involved in a lot of projects, most obviously in getting the securities branch license in Tokyo, which was a very challenging project. So the track record of thinking things through and getting them done and could do strategy in a bank. And for people moving into banking, if you've done model, model validation insurance company, you have a good chance of getting an equivalent job in a bank. The capital adequacy in insurance leads to the regulatory submission for solvency to that CEOSA for banking is ICAP. As I said, not the same, but very similar. We had a webinar last year where I did it with a friend. He was a milliman and does OSAs. I was doing ICAPs. We could swap jobs. We might take a few days to catch up, but very similar. Asset liability management, very similar. Reserving, very similar. Product pricing, similar. Hedging, hedging is different. Technical skills are similar. There's much more hedging in a bank. In an insurance company, you would expect only to be hedging to reduce risks, whereas banks are very much involved in derivative markets, will be doing trading in them, both for their customers and from their own account. So the technical skills that are in one of the IFA courses are appropriate, but it's a much bigger area in investment banking. And it's an obvious one for actuaries to be involved in working with many people who have PhDs in risk management specialized areas. And then finally, and obviously in risk management, the most obvious area for actually moving into ban banking is in their risk management credit is central. And I come across people who work in all areas of banking risk management or in the more senior chief risk officer role. So for actuaries who've got going in insurance, if they want to move into banking, the obvious thing is to switch across. The next slide is more thinking about younger people because we know it's a problem in a job, a rather circular argument. You want to do the job, have your own experience, and I want to do the job to learn about it, and you're around in circles. But the barriers to entry are reduced when there are new regulations or changes in the market. So although you call it <coughs> a different thing in India, in the UK we've had open banking where APIs have been built to a common standard to allow transfer of data between banks <coughs> and then the application of whatever you call it, data science or machine learning to this data, either, as I say here, to develop innovative products and services for customers or to manage fraud or other risks. So this is a huge new area. Banks have got tons of data. If my bank does your bank account, your current account and your credit card from the transactions, we can know as much about you as you do. It, it tells you everything you need to know about a person's financial behavior. So there, there is huge amounts of data. Actuaries may not be as skilled as people who've done a machine learning PhD, but the data science is a very good start. And we know much more about products and banking regulation and risk management and because we operate under the code, we are careful about the data matter. The data should be used in the interest of the customers, not in the interest of the bank and so on. So within this area, actuaries can make a very important contribution. And it leads in retail banking to a more competitive market. 
the more banking moves online, which COVID-19 has greatly increased in many countries, the customer is in control and banks have to be much more careful about the product pricing because we can search the market and switch between providers much more easily than was the case in the past. In the past, you had to go into branches, meet people, fill in forms, huge hassle. Now with price comparison websites developed on the back of open banking, we are in control and can do things. So banks have to really step up their game in product pricing. I mentioned actuaries were recognized as being good at that. There are many opportunities to be involved in this new world of open banking, data science, machine learning, really, really exciting to the future. Now, that could be in banking other areas. I don't know about other areas. What I know is that banking has so much data. And the governor of the Bank of England made the point that only retail in aggregate has more data than banking in aggregate. So if you're interested in the future world of data science and machine learning, banking is an obvious place to be. And thirdly, given our skills and personalities, I think many actuaries like me don't really like just managing people and so on all day and filling in forms and writing reports and normal management bureaucracy. I think we do like this problem solving things. And where there are these problems, the fact you're an actuary, there are not many actuaries in banking is much less of a problem because banks need people who want to work in this area. As so long as we start with their needs rather than our exams, we could go to a bank now and say we're really interested in matters like these three and would like to work in these areas and have skills and experience appropriate for them. The first of the three is sorting banks out after COVID-19. Banks have done a pretty good job during COVID-19. There haven't been the same worries about bank failures as there were during the banking crisis. Firstly, governments have helped. Secondly, banks have behaved responsibly. They haven't drawn in their lending. They have allowed customers to keep operating during the period, often giving them holidays on interest payments. But there's a lot to sort out after that. Many people with mortgages have had mortgage payment holidays. Now we need to face up to are they viable or will some of them default? So there's a lot of work to do, which is quite different from business as usual and would be a way to really get into credit risk on a project that all banks would have to do. I mentioned the climate change stress testing. I would say that over and over again, given that we're looking to the future for young people, this is a, a very interesting area. I met a, a young actor this week, I guess about 30, who had moved to a large bank specifically to be in this team. And I was very impressed that she had chosen to do that because I think being there will be a central issue and gives an opportunity to really get on in the bank because it will be something that will be of interest to the board and senior management. And so you can do a very interesting job, help the bank and progress your own career by doing a task like that. Then there is what they call non-financial risk. I don't like the term, but banks and regulators are using it. <clears throat> what they mean here is that banks have done a lot of work on their models for their main risk, credit risk and market risk. And whereas everything could be better, they are pretty impressive. But there have been worrying problems of IT failures, cyber attacks on data and conduct risk. You've read about them, I'm sure, in the media. And so the regulators are encouraging banks to 
focus more on what I call risks that are hard to quantify. And the first question is whether you can quantify accurately. These are tail risks. They are very infrequent, very large losses. So tail risk modeling is very different in the first place. In practice, it may be important to try and improve the processes to prevent these risks happening in the first place. Now, the benefit for actuaries here is that this is like a new area. You can go to a bank. You don't need to worry about people who've been doing this job for 30 years because they haven't. It's a new thing where outsiders should be welcomed by banks, bring fresh ideas and work with experienced bankers to address these problems. Again, the label of an actuary is not the route into it. It's the skills and abilities we have as actuaries, which can be good. So there are areas like this where things change in banking and these make it much easier for new people to enter the field. Moving on to the next slide. You, there were some questions about additional skills you might want to be in banking. So firstly, speaking about the IFOA, we have gone through the core subjects, which would lead you to think insurance, insurance and pensions were the only place you might go. And we've included mention of banking and examples of banking. For example, in CM1 loan pricing, CM2, this expected credit losses issue, in CB1, the sort of an expansion of that slide on bank's balance sheet and the profit and loss account. On CB2, how banking can lead to asset bubbles and exacerbate recessions, make the ups and downs of the economy worse, how cyclical banking can be, and lots of things in CP1. So we haven't changed the syllabus or changed the course, but we've tried to alert students to the fact that while a lot of this stuff is directly applicable in insurance, it is also applicable in banking. And the next slide, over the last year, We've been working with South Africa, which launched its banking exam in 2015, to develop these two courses, an SP and an SA fellowship exams. You will see that they're like my simple slide, that in the left and the right, there are five of the nine items are about credit risk, market risk, operational risk, capital and liquidity. On the left about measurement, on the right about management. But that is the core of banking. So there's a very comprehensive coverage. And this will go beyond many of the publicly available courses would be like the left, like the SP, how to work out the risks. On the right, it's very practical as to how to manage them in a banking operation under the Basel and national regulations. And then to enable actuaries in banking to move to senior management positions, we include in the SP overview at the beginning and a chapter on product pricing and in the SA chapters on governance and strategy, including some of these topics. So my comment if you were to ask me, are these courses good? Obviously, I've helped to write them, so I'm biased. But when I first met the people in South Africa who had written the original course, I was very impressed because in the last 10 years, in working with fintechs, I've given, and being an academic at Cash Business School, I've given them my own training on what they need to know about banking before they go to meet the Bank of England. And this course covers the same topics and is very thorough. So I'm very happy that for people who want to sit exams, this is a very good course. I wouldn't be negative in any other course, 
that's for individuals to choose. I would just express my confidence that this course or these two courses would enable people not only to do the management on the left hand, the measurement on the left hand side, but to do the management jobs, to do this understanding and judgment and problem solving that actually is generally enjoy. But I, I wouldn't say to you that actuaries in banking have to do exams. I didn't do an exam in banking. Many people in banking didn't do exams. I don't think you have to do an exam, but I think if you are interested in the career in banking, these exams are very suitable for actuaries. Remember, the main point here is that ASA had a subject called F206. We thought it was very good, but we thought it was too big and overwhelming. And we suggested splitting it into principles applications. And we're pleased to find that ASA were minded to do the same thing. So we work very happily with them and are confident that this course will be ready for some time next year. We haven't given the exact date, but things are going fine. Now, it's not just exams. So I said, first of all, you don't have to do exams. It would be quite sensible to do exams. You don't have to. But I think you do have to do other things I'm going to mention on my last couple of slides. So on the next slide, I talk about widening our way of thinking. I think this is very important in a bank compared to an insurance company, that you're not working in a bubble of actuaries. You're working with lots of different people and have to develop relationships and get their confidence and speak their language. So if I met a young actuary now at CAS Business School, who said, what more do I need to get into banking and on in banking, I would say widen your ways of thinking. First of all, in banking, be aware of these consultations. Don't study them like a textbook, but if you go for a job interview and know that there are things happening in stress testing, it will be good. If you don't know, it will not be so good and may be bad. You might be expected because they're living and breathing it. They can't believe people outside don't know about it. And the need for general knowledge. I've read for more than 30 years, The Economist is very readable. It gives me a broad awareness of what's happening in the economies and markets. I often disagree with it, sometimes think it's nonsense, but it means I'm relatively up to speed on topics. And if something comes up, I've heard of it, even if I'm not an expert. On IT, if I were a young actuary, I would want to know about FinTech. I would recognize, as I mentioned, that people doing PhDs in machine learning know more than I'll ever know, but I wouldn't want to be ignorant of this subject. I want to be able to work with and manage people who work in the sharp end of FinTech. It's so important for the future of banks as IT financial companies. Then in accounting, things like this IFRS 9 rule are important. So we wouldn't necessarily need to know the details. There are plenty of accountants in banking who will know every page in this document. What we need to know is what it means, what it does, what its objective is, how it works. And on climate change, quite a number of countries now have published some initial document. Again, we shouldn't be studying it, just knowing what is happening, following the story. There's been a lot of talk about negative interest rates. In fact, this really changed. Even though I did this slide a few weeks ago, obviously inflation rates are higher in the States and some countries, so there's less worry. But it's something that might come up. If you work for a bank, people would like to say to you, as an obviously able person, what do you think of negative interest rates? Would there be a problem? Would there be okay? And I think you need to understand strategy. I think while we are at heart risk managers, the banking is not like the actual world. They don't take pride in their own models in the same way. They're more interested in the P&L and the business outlook. So I think we need to see risk from a strategic point of view, 
not just an operational point of view. So I think we need to understand competitive advantage and how we're doing compared to other banks. People love to talk about this in a bank when you go and meet the business people. Then my final advice on the last slide is how, looking back at my career, how would I talk to people about how to get on and be successful in a banking role? I think it's important that we continue to learn. When I was young and training in Edinburgh, I did have a worry or a sense that actuaries worked so hard, passed all their exams, and then had a fairly straightforward career afterwards, progressing in their company without much challenge. Nowadays, people don't tend to stay in the whole company of life. People tend to move around. Opportunities arise, and you may want to seize the opportunity. Maybe you've seen the people in the coffee shop and hear of something that interests you and feel you would like to do that or something like that. So I think it's very important to take advantage of opportunities that we learn from our colleagues. And in London, it's great, of course, you meet so many people and can talk to them and learn from them and share with them. And also learning through CPD. I've taken CPD seriously. I hate filling in the form each year, a big rows each year because they don't understand banking compared to insurance. But I do try and make sure each year I have learned something new. As you'll gather from my talk today, this year, my real achievement has been to learn a lot more about climate change and about what banks have been doing in stress testing. And I'm glad to have done that and feel very happy that that was a good thing I can put in my annual return on CPD and show the papers I've written or webinars we've done on this subject. For so, you know, in banking, I think an appropriate way is to be volunteering for special projects. I mentioned not being political in a nasty way, but being politically aware. If you're involved in a special project, you get known by senior executives, you know in the company, and then when a problem comes up, they'd like to come and say to you, we've got this problem, can you work on this project? They don't know everybody in the bank. It may be a bit unfair, but if you put your hand up, then you'd like to be asked in future provided that first project going well. And then I end on my repeated theme that for me, banking is banking. But for me, it was all about every new day, a new problem to solve and lots of opportunities to really get into it and to understand and then express judgment on the problems. Always interesting, always new and continues to be so. Now, before you ask any open questions. I mentioned very briefly some questions that have been sent in. One was about banking actuary versus an investment actuary. Obviously, in bank, we don't use the terms banking actuary, but in mainstream banking, credit is the main point. In investment, the capital markets and market risk are the main point. So they are different fields and are different cultures. The investment banking is much more hard work, 24 hours a day lifestyle. Investment banking is more normal. Investment banking is clearly higher paid. Then there's a question, very sensitive question about there are not many actuaries in banking. The question was asked about developing countries, but obviously it's true worldwide. I think the main here is that students are conditioned by the courses. As I said, the IFOA core subjects mentioned insurance and pensions all the time, but hardly ever mentioned banking. So it's because a mindset to go into insurance. There may also have been a fear of the unknown, and a sense that going into insurance will be easier, a more established route. I don't see there's any resistance. In my 30s in banking, I see no resistance to employing actuaries. But it's not, I repeat, because you're an actuary. It's because you are interested in their problems and have skills to achieve them. So I think banks are happy to employ actuaries, 
but that's by the way you're applying to be in a particular role and for me i was fit for the role the fact there was an actually it was a bonus because it made people feel i would do a good job and they could trust me the question about job security in banking i think i mentioned that when i started work well my father started work in a bank and worked out every day until he retired and that was normal for people when I started work, that was still the expected norm, but it changed. So I think in banking and in other areas, there is a question about long term working for any company. In terms of job security of actuaries in banks, I could give a very positive report. I would say that when I and some of my friends joined banks, our bosses didn't know what actuaries could do and whether they would add any value in particular, but we became indispensable. The idea of being disposed of seems incredibly far-fetched because we became key. We were not the big managers managing hundreds of thousands of people. We were the key people to go to when a problem arose. So I think in going to a bank, there's a period of transition that probably lasts about a year till you get yourself organized but I think entries in banking are pretty secure because there are few people in the world, never mind what actuaries, as I most people quite like a tick box compliance job, just doing what they're told, getting on with it, going home in the evening. Actuaries are difficult people. They are quite controversial. They want to challenge, understand, don't just necessarily accept what the boss said. They want to get their own pencil. These are the characteristics that often lead to them being said to be introverted, but these sure are good qualities for solving problems. And then in banking as a whole, the last year of COVID-19 has showed the transformation of many industries. So in the UK, high streets that look half empty, will retail recover or will just rely on Amazon or online suppliers? And so for the world in general. But when when I look to young students at CAS and their future, I don't know about insurance, I mean, not really what's insurance, but in banking, banking is essential to the economy. Banking is based on data and has IT to use the data. So banks are not Googles, but banks are essential to the economy. And this new IT data-driven banking is to me as exciting as Google. So if you want a company in the future and you like this IT data science stuff, then a bank is sensible for you because in your comfort area of financial services, as opposed to just being in technology, and we can bring so much about our understanding of risks in financial services. And then a fourth question about that was asked beforehand was about us as actuaries being recognized compared to CFA, CA, MB and other courses. So this is a really important question where the various actuary bodies have to do more to promote actuaries to banking. More work has to be done. In fact, the CFA is very limited. It's a great qualification for investments for capital markets, but not about credit risk or other risks in banking. So it's good, but it would not have helped me much in my job. In terms of an accountant, I always work with accountants. They do their job, we do our job. You live alongside them. We're not competing with them, but of course they are recognized and they will be in the job description as an actuary is not. An MBA, I think, is a very good thing. I didn't think for a minute doing an MBA and wouldn't always encourage people to do an MBA, but it fits my point about widening your skills. The good thing about MBA is it does teach you to communicate, have a go, engage with people. Um, so that would be a, a good thing. I think the other banking risk management qualifications are not superior, but I recognize they are better known. So in my 
current work with the IFOE, once we get these courses finalised and able to hand them out, a job to do is certainly to communicate with central banks, banks, consultants, fintechs, all kinds of different people about actuaries doing banking. It's not a new thing. There are quite a lot of actuaries in banking, but it isn't well known and recognised. And it's important that the IFA and other professions don't keep it too quiet. So those are the questions I got. Deshank, happy to answer any other questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Ian. I think uh, it's a, such a power pack that you have provided so many insights. Uh, uh, I mean, you have answered most of the questions through your slides and uh, the questions that we already sent. I think few of questions that have come up with from the audience uh, are related to pressure actuaries. Uh, I mean, they want to understand how can an entry level student, entry level pressure can add value to the bank. Because uh, at the senior level, uh, it, it, it makes sense that actuaries can really be a bridge between CFO and CEO. But how can a pressure level actually really va add value to uh, the company? The most obvious area, the single most obvious area is in the data science area. Mm -hmm. Because there is a huge explosion of this. I repeat, as you know, banks have tons of data and there is a complete lack of skills in the UK and internationally. Now we can contribute to this work. We are not machine learning PhDs. We can contribute to that area. So that is an obvious area <coughs> where there is a shortage. Now if young students wanted to do it, they've got to think, where would they then apply? Because as you know, large banks are quite bureaucratic and will not perceive what it actually is. Whereas alternatives like fintechs and consultants or investment banks will just recruit people because of their ability and take the best person for the role and be much less bureaucratic in general in their process mm -hmm. and for a young actually starting working in a fintech or a consultant might be culturally easier than starting in a bank it depends on the bank and it depends on the country so i'm making the point that fintech data science is the most obvious area it doesn't have to be in a global bank an alternative which some students do is to go to a global bank and do their two-year graduate training and then decide what they want to do. That's a perfectly viable thing to do. It, it may be slightly dull for the first two years, but they do give you a very thorough training in banks and then you can move on. So it, it would be worth being patient if you wanted to work in a large bank to go through the to go through the graduate training, not being specially recognized in actuary. And then most banks, as you know, have a pretty good internal promotion thing. They don't want to lose people. So once you into the bank and established, you could apply to be in a particular area. So these are two examples of how to, I think in general, it's not just in banking. When I meet students at CAS, the recruitment process in many companies is a nightmare. Many interviews, psychometric tests and so on, it's very different as young. So we just have to be patient and play the game in the recruitment exercise. Definitely, definitely. Uh, another question that has come up uh, is from your slide where you mentioned about the special projects that are being done in the banks. Uh, so maybe if you can give any example or use case, uh, the kind of a special project that banks do where actuaries can be involved. Uh... Well, I think that it's just that banks tend to be large. The fintechs are very small and specialist, but because companies are large, banks have to be quite large to support them. And I'm not critical of banks. I've enjoyed every minute of my career in banking, I'd be happy by working for any of them again, doing my career all over again would be terrific. But if we are critical of banks, they tend to work in silos. People here who work for banks 
will know that people, even in banking risk management, would tend to work in credit risk or market risk or operation risk and not really engage with each other. I mean, I was doing strategy in a bank. Often you're facilitating engagement of people who should have known each other but never met each other. So in a bank, there is a observation. It's not a criticism or my own comment of people working in silos. <clears throat> we may not think much about it, but we are trained in ERN, Enterprise Risk Management. We are not limited to credit risk. We're, we're taught the principles of risk management and then the ability to apply these to whatever problems arise. That is a huge advantage compared to people who become lost in one silo. So when a problem arises, for example, this issue of sorting out banking after COVID-19 is the thing that a bank might say, we need a project, we need to get it all cleaned up. There will be some losses. We need to get it sorted out. We need a project team. And that would happen to be largely credit risk. The climate change example is much broader. But it's not normal in banks. Because we work in silos, they would set up a formal cross-silo working party or project team to look at this. <clears throat> it could be led by a senior risk person or a senior finance person or when I was at RBS, a strategic person and you'd have people from all over and actuaries are particularly suitable for that because of this enterprise wide thing of not being stuck in one little area and also on this picking up thing not not whistleblowing not be negative but uh, being open and constructive and engaging and expressing views I think actuaries are pretty good so it is a very good way to get on in a bank because banks are large. And again, in generalizing in banks and large companies, I was talking in general theory, the middle management of large companies can often try and defend their position and not want to be challenged by bright young people. And you may not be visible. So if you're in a project team like this, you become visible to senior people. And then, as I said, when there's another problem, they come back to ask you. So actuaries are well suited for these projects, which often occur in banks, provided they are not stuck in a silo and are willing to learn new things in a different area and apply the principles they already know. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, John. That's great. Uh, another popular question that has come up is about the technological advancement that has happened in last decade in the fintech and bank. Right? Uh, what's your insight on how is it going to affect the actuaries work, the opportunities that might come up for actuaries because of these technological advancements, AI, blockchain, and a lot more automation has happened. Uh, so maybe your insights on uh, how this will affect actuarial profession. Well, the first comment is that I'm very pleased that the IOFA has done this certificate in data science because it's a positive and visible step rather than just sticking to our old ways. When I make the comments about it's not a PhD in machine learning, I mention that because our younger son, who's he did a PhD at Edinburgh, Edinburgh University is very good at machine learning and he works in big data. But, um, and a lot of people there are in fact working in medicine, some in financial services. So this, by doing the certificate, the IFO has demonstrated awareness of the importance of this. I have no involvement in their strategy or planning, but I've been taking the strategic step. It would not be difficult to have additional courses or papers in data science or machine learning, I've been taking that step. I think the step they've taken is very important. So that means that they could go, the president of the IFA could go and meet fintechs or the fintech part of large banks and talk to them and explain how actuaries can add value. 
The other point in this broader theme, you were talking about automation. And of course, in India, you do so much outsourcing, we're taking jobs away from the West and machines will take the jobs away from people. But it does underline the need for understanding and judgment. So I can imagine even many actuarial jobs of just computing values will be automated. So it is very important that we look to jobs where we are, where we have a long term future, not just a processing job.